Good afternoon. I'm John Lindahl. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Nebraska History Museum the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule for this series as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and the services can be found on our website, which is nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Our speaker today is Karen Keir, Nebraska State Historical Society Photographs Curator. Her topic is Taking Care of Your Family's Heirloom Photographs. Please welcome Karen Keir. Well, um, thanks for coming to the Brown Bag Lecture today. And uh, like John said, my name is Karen Keir, and I am the, well, technically I'm the curator of the visual and audio collections here at the State Historical Society. Um, I've only been here about a year, so this is my very first Brown Bag Lecture, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, we're going to be talking today about how to care for your heirloom photographs. Specifically, we're going to talk about what exactly is what I'm talking about when I say heirloom photographs. We're going to talk about what causes the, um, harm to your photographs, um, as well as how to keep them safe. And I <laughs> hopefully will have lots of time at the end for questions. So what exactly is an heirloom photograph? Well, honestly, everything you have is an heirloom photograph. You take those photographs because they mean something to you. And by doing that, you're putting value on them, a personal value, a, a, an emotional value on those photographs. So we want to do everything what we can possibly do to take care of those photographs. So on, there's some great, um, but for this particular lecture, what I'm going to focus mostly on, because we do only have an hour, <laughs> is we're going to talk about early, um, late 19th century and early 20th century um, photographic prints. The things that you're most likely to find in your family collections. Um, but you should know there's lots and lots and lots of different types of photographs um, and negatives, um, which we will cover or I will cover um, in much more in depth when we have a photograph workshop in the fall during Archives Week. Um, you can find out when that's happening um, by coming, becoming a friend on our Facebook page or checking out our website at nebraskahistory.org, uh, uh, isn't it? And I have it up there wrong, so it's .org. Um, so what are some of the most common types of photographs in your home? Well, there's lots of different types of prints. Um, there's albumin prints, which are actually um, uh, most common from the probably about the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. Um, and those are actually prints made with egg whites. Um, then there are uh, collodion prints, which is made out of a sticky plant substance. And most commonly, um, what we're probably most familiar with are the silver gelatin prints. These are the most common, like, black and white photos. Um, these became most popular in the, starting in the 1890s or so. They were available earlier than that, but we see the most of them from the 1890s on up until color, well, on up until today, but really we see much more color photographs now. Um, there's also lots of people have lots and lots of negatives. I always get the question, well, do I really need to keep the negatives? Yes, you really need to keep the negatives. They actually hold much more information than what's on, in your prints. So negatives are important, and they should be cared for just as much as the prints. Um, there's glass plate negatives. There's flexible negatives. And what I mean by flexible negatives are, are negatives that are on um, plastic, um, different types of plastic, whether it's nitrate, acetate, or um, polyester. Um, and uh, those kind of are, um, those are actually kind of scary to deal with sometimes because they deteriorate pretty rapidly. Um, and then there's also those things called like slides. These would be the positives on either film or glass. Um, slides, lantern slides, those 35 millimeter slides that well, I'm sure we all have our vacation slides on. Um, those are important to save too. Uh, but there's other types of photographs, too, and these are some of my favorite types of photographs because they're kind of unique and different. Um, daguerreotypes was one of the very first processes of photographs. They started um, early, early on um, and were the first commercially viable type of photograph. Um, ambrotypes um, are photographs on glass. And then there's tintypes, which tintypes are pretty common. Tintypes uh, became really common because they were very cheap to make. They were durable. 
and um, especially during the Civil War because they could be sold for just pennies. So you have all these soldiers in their spiffy new uniforms posing for the photographers so they can mail their tintypes home to their, to their mothers and girlfriends. This one here is actually a tintype in a case that you're looking at with some pretty bad damage. So what is actually damaging your photographs? Well, the main causes of damage to your photographs are temperature and humidity, light, um, pests and other bad things, poor storage, and you. <laughs> so uh, we're going to break this down and start talking with um, relative humidity. We're going to start off with relatively relative humidity because it is the most important environmental factor when it comes to your photographs. Um, relative humidity is the amount of water in the air. Um, we actually, when we walk into the room, we're much more likely to notice changes in temperature, and we're going to notice those big swings in temperature much more than we're going to notice big swings in uh, relative humidity. For a photograph collection um, in an archival setting, um, and I'm very clear that this is archival ideal setting and not necessarily your home setting, um, is about 40% relative humidity. Um, so it's kind of the medium range. Anything um, more than 50% to 100% can cause all sorts of problems like oxidation, fading, and um, mold. Fungus is a nice way of saying mold, but we don't want mold on your photos. Low levels of humidity, which is 30% or less, can cause photos to become brittle and they'll shrink unevenly. Um, this is especially uh, common when photos are on different types of paper or different types of plastic, uh, diff uh, different types of paper, depending on what they're mounted on. The, um, the emulsion will um, suck in the moisture much more than, say, like the paper would. So your, your emulsion is spreading more than your paper, and then it cracks. Just like, um, not uncommon, like a piece of wood furniture. Okay, y'all have had wood furniture damaged by water and it starts to crack. Um, that's what happens to your photographs as well. As well. Um, what we want to avoid are these big fluctuations in relative humidity. We want to keep it as even um, as possible. Uh, temperature and humidi relative humidity are very closely linked. So um, one plays off the other. Um, temperature, go back to that middle school science class. We all know what happens when we raise the temperature of a chemical reaction. And really, deterioration and the breakdown of the photograph is a chemical reaction. Photographs, after all, that's what emulsion is, is just a bunch of um, chemicals all like mixed up um, until we make a photograph. So by raising that temperature, you're speeding up that chemical process, and you're speeding up deterioration. So an ideal temperature for an archive is um, 60 to 65 degrees. Now, you're not going to have your home at 60 to 65 degrees. So what your most ideal temperature is, is room temperature, kind of a cool room temperature. Um, but you want to keep it that nice, even, steady temperature again. Um, like anything below 65 degrees is, is not really comfortable for people to work in. And, and you can ask any one of us curators here that 65 degrees is really not all that comfortable. But you get used to it. So um, you want to keep the temperature as low as possible without raising the relative humidity. Um, what happens if you put your, free, your photographs in the freezer or the refrigerator is, is when you take them out, which is why I don't suggest doing this, by the way. Don't put your photos or fr in, in the freezer by any means, um, unless they're packaged up correctly, um, is when you take them out, condensation happens. And of course, you know what happens when water touches your photograph, everything smears. So the key to temperature and uh, relative humidity is, is that you want to, um, and the combination of high temperature and high relative humidity is one of the worst things that can cap into your photographs. Um, what happens, and you can see here on this slide, is um, that is a glass plate negative. It's probably from about the turn of the century, probably about 1905, 1910. And what's happened is that somebody very smartly, or thought they were doing a good thing, is put a piece of tissue paper in between each of the glass plate negatives to keep them from scratching each other. Sounds logical, right? The problem is, is that they put it into a poor storage conditions, 
where the relative humidity got too high and it caused the emulsion to become sticky. And that tissue paper has now embedded itself into the emulsion into that gelatin because really gelatin is gelatin whether it's jello or, or that's what happens is it gets sticky when it gets when the uh, relative humidity gets high unfortunately there's not a whole lot i can do to this photograph because if i get it too wet it's just going to remove the emulsion and um, i can't exactly scan it through the paper either so um, we've actually this photograph is um, a great teaching tool at this point of what not to do. So, um, like I said, what you want to do is create a nice, stable environment. You want to avoid places where, with, um, without, with, or you want to avoid places without temperature control. That means your basements, your attics, and for goodness sakes, not your garages or barns either. I've seen photographs collections come in from your barns. It's, it's never pretty. Um, but what you, what the, so achieving that consistent um, temperature and humidity is going to be most common in, inside your home. Um, under your bed is a great place to store it, especially if it's a second floor bedroom where you don't have to worry about flooding. Um, also, interior closets are a good idea too. Um, closets with exterior walls sometimes have variations um, in them, but uh, if you can, under the bed and interior closets are my, where I recommend them to uh, use. Um, also by putting them into proper housing, um, archival envelopes and archival boxes or, or photograph albums um, are also going to help buffer them from those uh, temperature swings. There are things called um, humidity strips, which you can see um, on the slide as well, where you can watch, um, it would, which will tell you what your relative humidity is um, at that point in time. You can purchase those from several different archival suppliers. Light. Light's just plain bad. It causes fading and yellowing, and once your photograph is faded, it's faded. And I'm talking about the original photograph. I know you can go in, you can scan it, and you can Photoshop it. But that's fixing the digital copy that's not protecting the original. That's what we're talking about today. Um, and it's permanent. The damage is permanent. Ultraviolet light, or UV light, causes the most damage. Um, you can buy things that protect your photographs from UV light, um, things like UV filters and, and UV, glass, uh, UV protection glass. Um, however, all waves of light, not just UV light, causes damage. And those films, those pieces of glass, only protect against UV light. So while you're taking out the most harmful of the, the light wavelengths, um, other things are still causing damage and causing fading. Um, some types of images are particularly light sensitive. Um, albumin prints, which are, are um, the ones that I said were most common, probably the most common um, 19th century photographs, so 1860s, 70s, 80s. Um, those are very sensitive. Cyanotypes, which um, most people don't know what a cyanotype is, but a cyanotype are the brilliant blue photographs. So they're the same um, printing process as blueprints, and they're very blue. I think they're cool, but most people think they're weird. Um, and then also color photographs. If you've ever looked at an old color photograph and it's starting to turn orange, it's not actually turning orange. What's happening is the blue and uh, is starting to, the blue and the magenta are fading away and it's just leaving the um, yellow pigment because the, the different layers fade differently. So what should you do? Well, my biggest recommendation is just display a copy whenever possible. Um, scanning and photocopying your photographs causes very little damage. Continual handling and continual exposure to light causes much more. Um, just keep your scanning and your photocopying to a minimum. Um, don't overdo it. Um, and then Put your original into a nice, safe, dark place with that nice, steady, relative humidity and temperature. However, if you are going to display your original, know that 
whatever damage you're causing is permanent. Um, and take some precautions. Uh, try to select a place on your wall that um, is out of direct sunlight. Choose glass that um, has a UV protection and um, match or mount your photographs in archival frames and mats. And um, most frame shops are very, very um, willing to work with you. So tell them exactly what you want. Be very specific. And, in, and monitor the fading. Keep an eye on your photographs. Pests and other bad things. Um, pests are usually the result of poor storage. Um, insects and mold breed in, mo in moist, dry place spaces. And all that organic material that makes up photographs, that gelatin and the albumin, that's egg whites and the paper that the photos are printed on, all make very tasty dinners for your insects and rodents. So what's eating your collection? Well, there's a lot of things that can come and eat your collections. Um, there's rodents. There's mold, and then there's different types of insects. The insect that is um, the long, kind of skinny one that looks really ugly, the, or, and the darker one, that's a silverfish. Um, those are common with paper collections. And then the other one is a German cockroach. Yeah. And then there's also things that aren't going to probably eat your photographs, but they're going to leave a mess behind. Um, rodents and mold. Uh, insects like cockroaches, flies, spiders, wasps, those kinds of things. Um, cockroaches and, and flies usually leave behind, well, everybody poops, right? Um, spiders uh, will, uh, the, 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 um, the silks, the, the, the webbing and stuff can be difficult to clean off of uh, photographs. And wasps really like to build their, um, their mud dauber things behind photographs for some reason. So um, what to do? Uh, prevention is the best protection um, when it comes to insects. Um, improve your storage condition, monitor your collections, and be on the lookout for telltale signs. Again, everybody poops, so keep an eye out for, um, for messes left behind. Um, insects, as they shed their skin, you'll find usually the skin and, not and, and may not see an ali a live insect. Um, and then if you do have a problem, or if you suspect you have a problem, protect yourself first. Because sometimes these um, insects, and especially rodents, can, can carry things that are more harmful to you than your photographs. So um, protect yourself. You may want to uh, get one of those surgical masks and rubber gloves if you think you do have a problem. Um, insects, or, or rodents, especially mice, can carry the hantavirus, um, and you need to be more careful. Um, you can use sticky traps to uh, see what is actually bothering your collection and eating your collection. Um, and there's some great websites out there that help you identify bugs um, to see what is actually eating, if it's eating it or if it's a harmful bug or if it's just a bug that's annoying. Um, and then contact an expert. Nebraska is very lucky to have a conservation center right here. Um, the Gerald Ford Conservation Center is in Omaha, and it's a division of the Nebraska State Historical Society. So contact an expert if you think you have a problem, or you know you have a problem. Um, storage condi uh, conditions, moving on to the next thing. Again, we're back to that, um, uh, creating a safe, stable environment making sure that that temperature and relative humidity is, is good and also that it's a waste from pests. Um, but you also need to think about <coughs> water damage. Um, and water can, damage can come from lots of different sources. It can come from nature, um, flooding. Um, I've taken lots of calls over the years um, from people who have just suffered either flood by nature or their washing machine has overflowed or something like that, and they're wondering what to do with their damaged photographs. So in choosing your storage con conditions, think about, your, uh, think about your photographs. Take a moment to think about the water that's around that area. Think about any pipes that are going through the area. Think about a washing machine that's next to it. 
Um, and then think about, I know I said uh, putting it under your bed is a good thing, but sometimes just raising your photographs an inch or two off the ground or anything an inch or two off the ground um, will protect it in case your floor does get flooded. Um, just pay close attention to your um, storage locations. And this goes not only for just your photographs, but any of your um, uh, heirloom things. Uh, air contamination, just the things that are in the air can um, uh, speed up deterioration. Gases that are given off as wood, cardboard, newspaper, um, and uh, sometimes a negative can cause damage. As they break down chemically, they give off a gas, and it's those gases that can cause your photographs to become um, discolored, yellowed, um, and then you also see a lot of fading and embrittlement. Embrittlement is just being like, it, if you pick it up, it often crumbles. Um, and also things like solid particles like dust, pollen, um, soot can cause scratches and uh, damage to the emulsions. Um, just a note on soot. <laughs> I know that a lot of people like to display their photographs on their working fireplace. Never a good idea, because what, what, I mean, my very first rule was don't raise the temperature. And now my, another rule here is, is avoid soot. So um, again, if you are going to display photographs on, on a, a fireplace, think about displaying a copy and not an original. So how do we go about store, um, improving our storage uh, conditions? Choose wisely. Um, take a moment to think about it. Look for water sources, avoid fireplaces, cedar chests. Cedar chests are bad. Um, and then remove old photographs. Cedar chests are made of, of wood. Um, and wood has quite a bit of acid in it. And that acid will leach into the photographs and discolor the photographs. It can cause yellowing. It can cause fading. Um, it can cause embrittlement. It can cause all the bad things we're trying to avoid. So um, cedar chests are not good for your photographs. Um, and old newspapers are often stored with photographs. And again, um, that old newspaper is pr usually printed on very cheap paper. Um, newspapers are only meant to last a day, so they don't invest in good paper. And that paper breaks, the newspapers break down very quickly. And as they break down very quickly, all the acids that are in the, pa in the cheap paper leach into whatever it's closest to, which is usually um, presbyterian a book or, or a photograph or, or whatever. But um, uh, I recommend making a photocopy of your newspaper clipping um, and uh, documenting where you got the newspaper cl clipping out, so the name of the newspaper or the date that it appeared on it and all that stuff, and um, getting rid of the original copy and keeping the photocopy of it. Um, now, and then store in proper photograph storage. You want to choose um, storage um, that will provide proper support and protection. Um, a good organized collection of photographs will improve organization and will also aid in disaster recovery because if you know what's in the box or you know what's in the album, it's much easier to um, save it as it gets um, damaged. have my handy dandy little finding aid here. This is an archival box that we use in the... Um, photograph archive in the archives here. Um, there's a nice label here on the outside of it that tells me what's in this box, which is my, um, my uh, visual aids here for the, this program. And then I have the photographs in um, acid-free um, folders that are nicely labeled. You probably can't see the label from where you're sitting, but they are labeled. I've used a pencil, not a pen, to label e even that. And uh, um, it tells me exactly what I should find in that folder. Um, you should only store your photographs in materials that have passed the photo activity test, PAT. Um, and when you purchase a photograph supplies, um, like from an archival supplier, um, and I've got a couple catalogs, so I just randomly selected one. Um, I should have really print, uh, marked my pages here. 
But on the page, it will actually say, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a mark there that says, pass the photo activity test. And that's really important to look for when you're choosing a photo um, storage for your photographs. What that means is that it meets or exceeds national standards that it will not react with your photographs. And it will not harm them. It's not the same as archival. PAT means it meets national standards and that it will chemically not react to it. Archival, or the term archival, does not have those same guidelines or rules. Anybody can use the term archival. Um, it's a great buzzword, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's completely safe. Anybody can put archival on their photographs. To put the uh, words um, past the photo activity test means that it has actually been tested and that it exceeds these national standards. Um, the th materials that you do want to look for should be um, acid-free, lignin-free, and unbuffered. Um, and we choose usually choose unbuffered photographs because some types of photographs, like albumin prints, prints, um, are react with buffered paper, um, which buffered paper is usually preferred for paper artifacts. Um, so and also choose the size that uh, is most close to the whatever you are storing. Um, envelopes come in uh, different sizes. My little goodie bag here. Um, either five by seven, four by five, uh, three by five, eight by ten. Um, so choose the one that most closely matches whatever photograph you're storing in it. You don't want it to be uh, too loose so that it slides around, but you also don't want it to be too tight so that well, you can remove it easily without it snagging on the edges and tearing something. Um, paper versus plastic. Um, paper or paper versus plastic. Um, I always choose plastic over paper. Plastic, by the way, is much more expensive than paper. So I choose plastic very carefully because um, I very closely watched on my budget. <laughs> and uh, plastic, I choose plastic for anything that is damaged, weak, or already torn, brittle fo photographs, um, things that are very thin and not well supported, or things that just get handled a lot. And I don't want them taken in and out of the paper every time somebody looks at them. Um, I choose paper over plastic for, for most of the collection, um, but it's especially important for things like nitrate and acetate a, um, uh, negatives that, um, as they break down chemically, give off a gas. Um, and also poorly processed prints because the uh, paper acts as, um, it will absorb some of the chemicals that haven't been um, completely washed out of the emulsion. Um, Paper housing materials should be chemically stable. They should have a specific RH uh, pH level. Um, again, unbuffered is usually recommended for all types of photographs. Um, they should be smooth and non-abrasive. Pass that PA te PAT test, that's very important. Um, and then don't use glassine or magnetic photo albums. Do you know what I mean when I say magnetic photograph albums? These are the albums that have those self-sticky pages with the piece of plastic that comes off. I uh, yes, people are yeah. All my fam, all my baby pictures are in these magnetic albums, and I keep telling my mom to take them out, but she keeps reminding me that I'm the professional <laughs> and I should do it myself. Um, so uh, those are very very bad. Those those magnetic pages, you know, the glue is 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 very acidic and is causing damage to the photographs, causing them to turn yellow and get um, and, and brittled and all that bad stuff. But for the most part, it also gets really, really sticky sometimes and you can't remove those photographs uh, or it becomes very, very difficult to remove those photographs without damaging them. Um, so if you do have things in those magnetic photograph albums, you should take them out right now. Um, the only trick that I've ever found that actually works is taking a piece of dental floss and shimming it down behind the photograph very slowly and very carefully. Um, and sometimes you can get them to pop loose from the magnetic pages. 
Uh, plastic materials should be chemically inert. Um, the main types are polyester, polypropylene, and polyethylene. Um, they should have no surface coatings. That includes um, a UV protectant for permanent storage. And they should, of course, have passed that PAT test. So now we've come on to the thing that causes the most damage. Um, and that's you. <laughs> uh, even in the most ideal storage conditions, photographs can still be damaged. I've been working with photographs a long time. I'm not going to lie to you. I've damaged photographs before. Um, and, uh, and and then, like I said, I'm trained to handle photographs, and I still manage to um, improperly pick them up. So just um, handling causes the most damage. Things are easily bent, torn, and cracked. Fingerprints damage the emulsion, but they also attract insects. So how to handle your photographs? Well, break out the nifty little white gloves. Um, white cotton gloves are great for that. Um, they're available, you know, they're available. Um, one of the best things about uh, scrapbookers is uh, scrapbookers are becoming very, very savvy, and they're making these archival supplies much, much easier to get a hold of. Um, so find some great white cotton gloves, or you can also use Laychex or nitrile gloves as well. Um, when you pick up a photograph, pick it up with both hands. Never pick up the photograph by the corners. The corners are probably the most fragile things, and they're usually the things I see um, missing from the photographs most often. Um, and if you do have a very fragile photograph, support it as you turn it over. And by supporting it as you turn it over, what I'm talking about is take your hand, lay it on the back of the photograph or the front of the photograph, the top of the photograph, to flip it over and support it with your hand as you turn it over. So you're not just turning it by the edge, you're giving it whole support as you flip it over. Um, use paper or mat board to support the fragile items that you're moving. You can very easily just run a piece of paper underneath a photograph and pick up the paper and handle the paper um, with the photograph um, on top of it. Labeling photographs. Labeling is always good, um, but just do it properly. Use proper names. I can't tell you how many photographs I have in my box of unidentified photographs that are labeled my grandmother. <laughs> or my Uncle Fred. I don't know who's Uncle Fred. <laughs> um, so. Use proper names. Um, if you know, if, if it is a woman, use um, both their maiden name and their married name. Um, use their full names. Try to write along the edge of the photograph. Um, and never, like this photograph, never write on the front of the photograph. Um, and use a pencil. Always, always, always use a pencil. You know, you're going to say, I can't write on the back of those resin-coated photographs. Well, there's actually... Um, a really great type of pencil, and you can pick this up at any craft store. Um, these are woodless graphite pencils, and they come in different um, textures, I guess, would you call it? Um, usually I choose the soft or the medium, and they will write on the back of those modern resin-coated photographs, modern, you know, like the ones you pick up from like the, like the drugstore today. Um, that are printed that you can't actually write on them with, um, but they this this pen and this is a very piece of plastic will you probably can't see that but it's writing on that piece of plastic it will write on just about everything and this is um, won't harm your photographs now ink especially ballpoint ink tends to be very very acidic and it will literally eat through the back of your photograph and into your emulsion so uh, don't use pens. Um, the uh, pens can also bleed through and smear, um, especially during a disaster. Um, and uh, you can always consider writing on the enclosure, either if it's plate paper, write on the paper with the plastic. If it's um, a or if it's paper, write on it. Um, if it's plastic enclosure, um, there are special archival markers available. Um, I I prefer like an Adenta pen 
or a Pigma pen um, that you can write on the outside of the um, uh, plastic enclosure um, before you put the photographs in there. That's the other thing I always have to remind um, people is if you're going to write on the enclosure, write on the enclosure before you photo put the photograph in. You don't want to write with the photograph in there. Um, when you are writing them, you want to write fairly lightly. Don't be, don't write too hard. Um, and I also don't prefer to, I like to use a sharp pencil, but usually after I sharpen the pencil, I sit and make some swirly designs with my pencil so that I get it just a little bit dull and I take off that really sharp point. Um, that will help stop breaking the um, paper fibers um, that are on the back of the photograph. Repairing photographs. Um, you know, a lot of times the good intentions, the things that you think are going to help, are actually going to cause more damage. Tears are often best left unmended. This is where it becomes really handy to have these paper or these plastic enclosures. Do not use, and I've seen all of these, <laughs> uh, tape, glue, rubber cement, staples, <laughs> thumbtacks, <laughs> or anything else to repair your photographs. Place the torn photographs into plastic sleeves. Um, this is a really beautiful glass plate negative that's gotten shattered probably years and probably 100 years ago. And they've used tape, not even tape to very, to even try to mend it. They just slap some tape on it. And unfortunately that tape is, is, is I probably can remove the tape and I probably will remove the tape, but um, it just gives you an idea that uh, it's not a good idea. Also don't use rubber bands. No rubber bands. Serious about that. No rubber bands because you know what happens is those rubber bands um, will break down and they will stick to your photograph. They also, um, when you bind up those photographs, it usually squishes down some of those photographs and causes a crease. But yeah, photograph uh, rubber bands are just, uh, try to avoid them whenever possible. Paper clips will also damage photographs. Um, I've seen a tintype, an old tintype, do you know what I mean by a tintype? Okay. Uh, it's a photograph on a piece of uh, uh, metal. It's not actually tin, by the way. It's actually a piece of iron. Um, but somebody had used a paper clip to attach the identification. Unfortunately, the paper clip was long gone. The identification was long gone. But there was this perfect imprint in this in this uh, um, tin type of the paper clip left over. And once you bent the uh, metal of the tin type, it exposes the metal to oxygen. And what happens to metal when it's exposed to oxygen is that it rusts. And then that rust causes the tin, the emulsion of the tin type to flake away. So you just cause several layers of damage by using that paper clip. Cleaning and repairing. Don't attempt to clean or repair an heirloom photograph yourself or allow anybody else, even commercial photographers, to not train in photo conservation to restore your old photographs. There are a, there are many, 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 many different types of photographs. Unless you have been very specifically trained to recognize each one of those types of photographs, um, especially old photographs, 19th century photographs. Um, don't try to attempt to clean your photograph. Some photographs won't react with water. Some photographs will react with water. Some um, can be cleaned with alcohol, whereas sometimes some photographs will dissolve in alcohol. So unless you know exactly what that photograph is and exactly what kind of mixture um, that the photographer was using, don't clean it. Consult a professional um, conservator. Um, what you can do is you can very gently remove the dust particles from your photograph. This is actually um, a, 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 um, a brush designed to remove dust from photographs. It's a photographer's brush. Um, but all you ladies out there, it looks just like a makeup brush, doesn't it? 
And honestly, it's about the same as a makeup brush. If you use a um, natural makeup brush, it does about the same job. And it's, it's cheaper, too. Um, to clean the photograph with your, uh, your dusting brush, um, you want to make nice, long, gentle, without touching too hard, sweeps across the photograph. What you're trying to do is just remove the surface dust and not scratch the photograph. Be very, very careful, especially if the photograph is, is very dusty, that you are not touching it very um, gently, or you're, that you're, you are touching it very gently, because if you push too hard, all that dust will scratch the emulsion as you swipe it with your, um, your nifty little makeup brush. <clears throat> so, remember these simple rules. Control your temperature and humidity levels. Again, I can't say this enough. No attics, basements, or garages where temperature is not controlled. Avoid light exposure. Um, display copies whenever uh, possible. Watch for things that are going to eat um, your photographs. Create a nice, safe environment. Um, use storage materials that have passed the PAT activity test. Um, and be mindful of how you handle your photograph. Use pencils and gloves um, and don't attempt to do repairs yourself. Here's my preservation golden rule, and this goes for not just photographs, but for any of your heirlooms, is never do anything to your photograph that cannot easily and cleanly be undone. All right, I think I have lots of time, about 15 minutes for questions, so. Um, sure, back there. What's the difference between that natural makeup brush and what, let's say a filbert brush that you use for oil painting? Um, a filbert, um, it usually, you're asking me what's the difference between a natural makeup brush and a filbert one that you use for hair, oil, uh, camel, camel hair brush? Yeah. Um, none. <laughs> Uh, although it can come down to the the density of how much the the um, the, uh, the the hairs are packed together, you want something that's fairly loose and not um, tightly packed, um, which is usually why I recommend makeup brush brushes because we want that very kind of dewy look going on. Whereas oil paintings, you want to stick that paint onto there. Um, again, you want it to be very, 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 very soft. Very soft. And you can come up and feel this brush if you like, but it needs to be very, very soft. Okay? Yes? What is a glassine album? A glassine album? Um, glassine is not necessarily an album. It is a type of storage material that was very popular probably back in the 70s and 80s um, that photographs can stick to. Um, that uh, most people don't run into them except for maybe professional photographers. Glass scene, what you get when you get stamps from the post office? Yeah, it is, it, it is the... Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Yes? I've got a couple of black uh, old uh, albums that have black pages on them, you know, the mm -hmm. pages are glued onto them. Yes. What's the best way to protect those? You're asking me how to protect an old photograph album that is on the black paper. Um, you know, that's a conundrum that a lot of people, a lot of photograph people struggle with, professional photographers or professional photo curators like me struggle with. Photograph albums are almost like a visual diary. And taking apart those photographs kind of takes apart its meaning. Um, however, those pages can also be common, causing those photographs harm. Um, if you feel your photographs aren't being too damaged, what I usually recommend is interleaving them with pieces um, of archival paper or archival um, uh, tissue paper kind of stuff. Um, but that only works if the, the if you have a soft binding and not a hard binding, because if you put too many layers between the photographs, you'll break the binding. 
okay? If you feel your photographs are, you notice that they are very quickly deteriorating or very quickly being um, damaged and you're seeing that they are yellow and brittle and things, then I recommend photocopying them or scanning the pages and um, so you have that, that reminder of how it was meant to be seen and removing them from the photograph album. But usually, I, usually removing them from the photograph album is my very last resort. Yes? We've got a box of tin types, mm -hmm. and they had just been thrown in helter skelter. Uh, identifying them is, is, a, is our problem. But how should we store them? You're asking me about how to store tin types. Um, tin types are I usually recommend storing tin types in paper enclosures, like like the ones I showed you. Um, and so that then you can label the outside of the tin, the outside of the envelope if you do find the identifications, um, and then um, putting them in into a box, into an archival box like this. Although you can get ones that are are smaller, more to the size of your um, your tin types. Um, but tin types, as long as they're um, in good condition. What you want to avoid is them um, getting bent and getting cracked and having that metal exposed to oxygen. And that oxygen is what's going to cause damage to um, the substrate, to the metal. And as that metal rusts, it will flake away the, uh, the emulsion. So that's what you want to avoid. OK? Any other questions? Yes? Uh, the old photographs that uh, are on cardboard. Yes. Are those album, album prints, or how do you recommend them? Okay. This is my teaching collection, so I'm going to take these out without my gloves on. But uh, remember that these are meant for teaching. Um, album prints, and again, we'll go through this more um, in my workshop in October. Um, so keep on keep looking at our uh, things. Albumin prints are what we often see as um, sepia-toned. It's what we've actually become trained to think of as sepia-toned, and that's usually how you recognize it, is this kind of all-over brown um, one. This is a sepia-tone that hasn't been faded too much, so it has almost these kind of deep purplish colors to them. Um, and this one is one that has been mold damaged. Um, but that's what a sepia tone, what an albumin print is. Um, it also only has um, two layers rather than like a silver print has three layers of photographs. So if you look at an albumin print, you can actually see or very closely look at an albumin print with like a, like a not maybe a microscope, but a, a very powerful magnifying. magnifying glass. Thank you. You can actually see fibers of the paper through the emulsion. Now, a silver gelatin print or um, a collodion print, you won't be able to see those um, paper fibers. So that's usually how we recognize it is that kind of all over sepia tone um, and uh, the, the paper fibers visible at magnification. So. Um, the question is, what about rubber made? Um, you know, it depends on what type of plastic Rubbermaid is. Um, typically, I recommend car, uh, like archival pla uh, paper boxes, archival cardboard boxes over plastic boxes because plastic boxes can, can sometimes off gas, and that that gas can cause harm to your photographs. Um, and then the other thing is is that the um, they seal. <laughs> they seal. So if you have any sort of moisture trapped in there with those photographs, they're trapped in there for good. And you can create this, um, I don't know, I was a 4-H growing up, so we would do these terrariums. And you have this almost terrarium effect where you create this, own, this micro environment. Um, and your photographs, as is, is, is kind of silly as a sound, aren't able to breathe. So. Um, Rubbermaid photo, Rubbermaids are great for disaster recovery because they'll protect it from getting wet, but not necessarily good for the photographs that this need that air movement. Okay. Well, a slide reservation. 
Slide preservation. Um, really, you can pretty much follow the same rules as this. Um, you can buy specific slide holders like this and keep them either in boxes or in um, archi our, I almost said archival, um, but acid-free um, uh, albums as well, like three ring binder type things. You'll see this one actually has um, all sorts of holes along the edge so it'll fit in all sorts of different types of binders. Um, but so you wanna say it followed basically the same rules. Um, even temperature, relative humidity, away from dust, um, watching it for mold and, 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 and things. But um, when you break it down, slides are basically the same process, chemical process, as photographs. So whatever will work for your photographs works for your slides. Okay? Yes? Are there any local places that sell the PAT storage devices or do you need to order them? Um, you were asking me about local places to buy them. Um, I believe there are. Yes, anybody here? No? Okay. Um, however, I'm new to Lincoln and I don't know the company's name offhand. Um, and let's see, <laughs> um, my assistant curator who does all the ordering for us, he would have it on the tip of his tongue immediately. Um, but I did provide um, the Ford Center a few years ago, put together a great list of resources that are available online. But um, I do believe there is some more locally that we um, occasionally order, we, that we order from as well. Yes? Does the Century Company? I, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with local. No, that's, that's a catalog. A cent the Century Company? They, they uh, sell uh, all sorts of albums and. Uh, cover pages, uh, slide photograph pages. Have you ever heard of them? Um, I'm not as familiar with the Central, uh, Century Company, but there's lots of great resources out there that are catering to um, people wanting to store their photographs and scrapbookers. Just following the basic guidelines that um, I've told you, looking for that PAT test approved um, will help you select that. Um, and, and that should follow the, the, basically follow my rules and, and you'll be okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys all for coming. Thanks for all the great questions. And um, uh, we'll get more information up on our um, soon about the archival uh, week in October about the workshop. And then I will talk about uh, the specific different types of photographs and how to recognize those different types of photographs as well as um, probably go over a lot of the same preservation information that I just did today too, but a little more in depth. Thank you.